Good morning, everyone. This is Margie Dean Gray, director of the foundation here at Port Lewis College, and I have probably one of the best jobs going here because I have a chance to interview wonderful, wonderful people in Notes and Notables, and today is no exception. In fact, it, I'm thrilled to have my guest here today. It's Pamela Hasterock. A lot of you probably know Pamela from her byline in the Herald under the food section. She has come up with some fabulous stories. Before we get into those, I want to find out a little bit more about you, Pamela, for the people who don't know you. So you've been here, what, about three years? Yes. So tell me a little bit, why did you decide to come to Durango? Where did you come from? You know, a little bit about you so the people when they see you in the street say, hey, Pamela, I know this about you now. <laughs> well, it's actually sort of a fun story. My husband and I um, came here in the fall, almost exactly this time of year of 2009, and we were doing, I'm an ancient history buff, and so um, it was a year that Europe just wasn't possible, and I said, well, let's do our own ancient history. So I wanted to find out about, you know, the Native Americans, and this seemed the spot to do. And so we started in Santa Fe, and we did Bandelier, and Chaco, and Aztec, and Mesa Verde, and finally my husband said, I don't think I can look at another Kiva. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, some girlfriends of mine had told me about Durango, that it was a lovely little town and we would enjoy it. So we came and we stayed out at the Apple Orchard Inn. And, um, and I can remember us sitting at Guido's on a beautiful day with the Aspens. It was October 1st or 2nd. And uh, on the front page of the paper was the death of Morley Ballantyne. And... Um, uh, and my husband said, could you live here? I was like, heck no. Um, <laughs> I'm from Florida. That doesn't work for me. But um, uh, three months later, there was an ad in the paper for the managing editor's job of the Durango Herald. And my husband applied. And uh, in July of 2010, we moved here. Wow, that is great. So you mentioned you're from Florida. Yes. And so what were you doing in Florida? Um, I was working at the Daytona Beach News Journal as a political columnist. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different from what you're doing now. Quite. So it, 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 tell us a little bit about the background with political, because that can be you know, a little bit edgy, and, and you can't take sides, I'm assuming. And so how did that affect you? I mean, did, did you, it give you the freedom to write the way you wanted to, or were you sort of, did you feel at times you were sort of locked in because it, you couldn't say one side or the other? Well, you know, as a columnist, and I wrote for many years on the opinion page, so I, I certainly did say one side <laughs> or the other. Um, uh, you know, I'm uh, opinion is uh, one of my expertises. So, um, yes, and it, you know, it made for um, a, a very rich and rewarding career, but it could also make for a difficult time in the community because oftentimes I was issuing forth with opinions that were against the um, norm of the business leaders and political leaders in town. But that's, to me, what a, what a journalist does mm -hmm. is to challenge the status quo and to um, keep the people in power on their toes. Well, so. you were obviously you needed to keep people on their toes because otherwise you're not letting them even think for themselves. So that's I think that's terrific. Did you find there was one issue in particular in Daytona that you, you stated, and, and as you said, not everybody's going to be on your side, that people came up and said, how can you, how could you have said that? I just can't believe that. Yes. Um, at Daytona Beach is uh, known sort of as the affordable coast, so it's more of a blue-collar town, and the businesses that have burgeoned there are those that um, speak to a party atmosphere. And the uh, sort of overwhelming um, thinking of the business community was, how do we get people to come here? How do we make this a place that people want to come to and that they'll spend their money? Because much of it was hospitality-based, the hotel industry. And um, also there was NASCAR and you know just, just um, a tourism uh, industry. It does have an absolutely stunning beach. But uh, for me, what was so difficult is, is that the kinds of um, business that they wanted to bring in were very detrimental to the community itself, to the people who lived there. So it was sort of a party till you puke mm -hmm. atmosphere, you know, spring break. And I mean, it really had gotten quite a terrible reputation in the 90s. And they were making a an effort to come back from that and make it a more respectable, family-oriented place for tourism. And, um, you know, to me, the, the issue is if a, a place is a lovely place to live, a lovely place to be, people will come. You, you don't have to lure them. You don't have to 
do anything. So that was a constant uh, form of conflict between me and the business community because I felt like they were looking at it in the wrong way. It was all about how, what, what can we do for other people? What can we do for visitors as opposed to what can we do for the people who live here? Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that which is one of the reasons I so love Durango. <laughs> Durango is all about, you know, we came here because it's gorgeous and we love it and we're going to do everything we can to make it beautiful as you yourself so often do in your volunteering. Well, you're so. Sweet to say that, sir. Well, let me go back to the political side of things because that, that is tough, you know, when you live in a community and you really want to be able to be part of what's going on and then you walk into a room and you sort of see those eyes looking at you like, hmm, not so sure I like that article that you just wrote. Do, did you have to constantly defend yourself? I mean, or did people just kind of say, okay, well, Pamela wrote this and this is her view and it's not mine and then you just kind of go on? I, I think that I was fairly much a shock to the community when I when I went there in the 90s and then they got used to me and got used to the role that I played in the community. And I think they stopped seeing me so much as an adversary, but simply as one who wanted to look at things from a different angle and who had a point of view that was not based in um, dollars and cents mm -hmm. and was much more, you know, sort of community based. And, uh, well, I would think the community would step forward for you because, and as they you did. said, you were trying to help them. Yes, and they did. And so I, I had, and I, I even think in the end that the, that the business community itself came around to see that what I was actually after was what was best for all, and, mm -hmm. and that that may not have meant them at mm -hmm. the moment, but it was what was good for for the the community and for the region. And what about Don? What was he doing at the time? He was the editor of of the paper of the mm -hmm. news journal. He actually is the one who hired me. We'd never met, mm -hmm. and he he hired me to. Mm -hmm work there. So when he approached you and said, you know, what do you think about Durango? And you went, no. So how did the next step happen? Because <laughs> obviously you're here. Yes. Well, the next step happened in, in that, um, you know, we had both worked there a long time and Don for a very, very long time. And it was one of the, it was a, a typical sort of, um, uh, you know, changing economy story at a newspaper. It was bought out. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he, and we had worked for a family who had owned the paper for 85 years. And the new owners were, um, did not share our mindset about journalism and about how, how one covers a community and the lines between business and journalism. And so, um, so it was obvious that we couldn't remain. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then we took a look at what our opportunities were and Durango seemed like a good one. Well, it seems almost like it was uh, meant to be because, I mean, you were, you know, looking, you were looking at something that was going to be different for both of you. And there it was, the yeah. Durango Herald. And, you know, and Durango is just, again, because it's so different from, you know, I grew up in Florida in Gainesville, but, you know, I mean, I, I lived there most of my life. But the the attitude of, of Durango, I, I'm just so enamored with this attitude of this is heaven on earth. We have found our paradise. And what can we as individuals do to make it a... Um, to make it that way, to keep it that way. And people here really, really put their time and their money where their mouth is. And mm -hmm. I just so appreciate that. Well, do you miss Florida at all? Oh, I miss it tremendously, particularly um, starting at Thanksgiving, yeah. you know, when the when the snow starts to stick. <laughs> I'm, um, and I, I've resolved because of that to uh, keep my crabbing about the, the weather. I, you'll never, ever hear me say it's too hot. Yeah. You'll never, ever hear me say it rains too much or that it's too muggy. This is fine by me. So I, I give myself four months of crabbing <laughs> from, from late November until April. And and um, so, yeah, I do. That, you know, I mean, Durango has no air and no water, and I miss them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that is true. But so tell me what you do like then about Durango in particular. Oh, you know. And it could be a million things. Well, it is. I love the food scene. I mean, as you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I write food stories for the Herald, and it just has an amazing food culture here that, um, you know, I didn't have even in Florida, where the growing season is so easy and so long. And um, so I'm constantly amazed by um, the quality of the restaurants and the quality of the food that I can buy to cook at home, mm -hmm. which is important to me. I really love that. I also love the cultural aspect here. Um, and as you know, I do volunteering for it, but I mean, Durango has the Durango Art Center. It's fabulous. I mean, there, there, um, you know, shows every, every month that are really, really wonderful. And, um, and I'm a board member for Music in the Mountains. And I can remember I had moved to town. We had not been here two days. I was walking down Main Street just to familiarize myself. Mm -hmm. And there was this big sign in the window, you know, classic 
music festival. And so I just walked into the office and bought, you know, six concerts right then and there. And I thought, you know, whatever, it's a cute little town and it'll be, a, you know, whatever it is, it'll be fine. Well, it was fabulous. I mean, it was just fabulous. And I'm thinking, I'm in this little teeny tiny town in the middle of nowhere, and they have an amazing classical music festival that lasts for three weeks. This can't be too bad, you know? So I, I like that focus. Also, there's a lot to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's cultural or it's civic or it's, there's a real sense of community, and I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, I know you do volunteer work, and we're going to get into that in just a second. But if you're just now tuning in, this is KDUR, and this is Notes and Notables with Margie Dean Gray. My special guest today is Pamela Hesterock, who is, you I'm sure have seen her byline many times in the food section of the Herald. So she started her career and for many, many years was a political writer. So this is a kind of a switch for her. And if you miss the first part of the show and you do see Pamela on the street or at an event or something, ask her about it because it really, um, it, I think it has formed who she is as an individual in looking very broadly at what life is and what a community life is is like so I appreciate the fact that you're you're here and I know and I of course have had a chance to work with you on some of your articles you know in the food section so tell us a little bit more about the say how did you get into the food p part of this um, my husband came home one day and said honey how would you like to write about food and I was like sure <laughs> you know it's work and it's writing and I like that um, and what was so fun about it for me was realizing that um, uh, you can't see me, but I love to eat. And she I, looks great. And Don't I love her. to cook. And um, and I sort of discovered at uh, this late stage in life that I was an expert. And I've always cared about food. I've always cared about what I put in my body. I've been... Um, uh, you know, and I have food issues that I think are part of the community at large, which makes me sensitive. I happen to be allergic to wheat, so the gluten-free movement, which I think you might otherwise have thought is a fad, you know, really affects some of us. Mm -hmm. And um, and and things like um, sugar, the need to get away from refined sugars and refined flours, and um, you know, because because it affects so many things in your body. And so it's a, a really nice way to combine something I totally love to do, which is cook and eat and dine out with, um, uh, you know, with writing, and what could mm -hmm. be better than that? Well, let me ask you, do you, um, you know, you mentioned sugar and flour, and those are all, of course, the things I love, you yeah. know, <laughs> especially We're Southerners, sugar, come on. <laughs> especially yeah. the, the sugar part of it. <laughs> so do you really try to do, gear all of your storylines specifically on staying away from flour, staying away from sugar, so that it's healthy, or is there... A time oh, when you no. go, let's just I'm, splurge and talk yeah, about making I, cookies. Right, I'm a Philistine. I, you know, I just, I, um, because I love food and I love to eat, you know, what one, you know, nothing is better than a good baked good. And I mean, one of the things that I've done in the two years since I've been allergic to wheat is lear learn how to, you know, how to cook gluten free and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, make a cake and make muffins and make things that I love. I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if, if I can eat it, I do. Mm -hmm. And you just know, you know, where it goes in your diet, you know, in mm -hmm. moderation. But um, no. And in fact, one of the stories that I'm thinking of working on are um, where are the best French fries in town? I oh. mean, so. <laughs> So, so there's my philosophy. So, you, you know, know, this sounds like a pretty good job. You know, you say, well, let's see, what should I do for next week? Let's talk about cupcakes. Well, I guess I'll just have to go out and find gluten-free cupcakes and just try them all out. Same thing with French. It sounds like you got a pretty good deal here. I do. I definitely do. I, I have to tell you the story about the difference between um, uh, writing about politics and writing about food. And because, you know, I mean, I truly have been writing about politics my whole career. I just started in it, and I never stopped. And um, in, in politics, I... Uh, I can remember once I was at um, a board meeting for the local um, uh, community hospital, which was very big and very important to the economy, and um, their director was considered sort of a BMOC. And I remember walking up to him with my hand outstretched, and he went right by me. It was like he didn't want to know me. He'd been unhappy with, you know, whatever I'd written. And um, I thought, oh, great, you know. Um, another time I had been in the legislature covering the the covering the legislature in the Capitol, and I received, they were sending me my mail. And this is this is back before the email days, mm -hmm. and in my mail there was a letter from an irate reader where he had um, put a teaspoonful of excrement. Thankfully, ah. it was, you know, several weeks old, so it crumbled <laughs> off, but I mean, that the point was made. Yeah. So this is, these are the things that one routinely 
um, deals with as a political writer. And in the food writing here, um, I, I, I find myself constantly trying to fend off gifts. People, you know, they want to comp me at the restaurant. or they, I wrote about this lovely, lovely uh, local chocolatier, and, and, you know, she was wanting to, you know, give me. And it's like, and, you know, in journalism, you can't do that. You right. can't take gifts from your sources. And, but, I mean, I really risk offending people, mm -hmm. you know, when I say, I, I just, I really can't do that. I really can't. You can so, try it, can't you? <laughs> no, you can't. I mean, even I mean, she said, to try this piece of oh, chocolate. Oh, I could say, I could try a piece of chocolate, but okay. I could not take home a box. box you right. know? And so I'm always saying, please, you know, let me pay for it or let me, oh no, let me give you, and it's like, where have I been all these years? <laughs> I obviously started out in the, in the wrong part of the profession. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a great story. It really is terrific. So if you had a favorite thing you were going to tell us about that you bake versus make, okay, so I want to hear both of them. What is your favorite thing to bake? Oh, well, sweets. Uh-huh. I, yeah. I mean, you know. And, but when, what in the sweet field? Because that leaves it pretty open. Um, well, you know, there's, there's a, uh, uh, pre-wheat allergy and post-wheat allergy. Um, uh, so, because things are so much easier to bake with wheat than they are with gluten-free flours, because they're completely different in their chemical structure, so things don't turn out the same. But um, I would probably say that um, pre-wheat, it was uh, um, cream puffs and mm. eclairs, which are my husband's favorite, so I learned how to make those, and you know, it just it's a little taste of France, you know, in your mouth. Um, and so that would probably have been my my pre-wheat <laughs> allergy favorite. And then um, since then, my, my go-to is, and, and it's such an old, old dessert in my family repertoire, is cheesecake. Hmm. And because it's, you know, it's easy to make and it's, a, it's, I mean, you know, there are five ingredients and it takes 10 minutes to get into the oven and then you put it in the fridge overnight and top it with fruit and, um, it and it's always go. a hit. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, um, so what happens if if, if you put a, a recipe in the paper and somebody says, um, you know, do you have a, a regular version of that? Let's say it's a, it's a gluten-free diet um, recipe. Do you, do you try to... I, I do both, and I and I rarely put gluten free in. I usually put in, you know, just a big because, you know, I mean, there's far more of the world that isn't allergic to wheat mm -hmm. than is. So mm -hmm. I, I I usually just put in regular recipes, and I I try them myself, and then I make my husband taste them. Yeah, I was going to say because make yourself <laughs> sick, otherwise, yeah, you know, probably. So, right. Yeah. So and what about other kinds of allergies that that you have to be aware of for you know the town like. Uh, lactose intolerance sure. and those kinds of things. How do you deal with those too? You know, um, I haven't paid quite as much attention to that, but I, I do know that uh, dairy, you know, um, and uh, many naturopaths and nutritionists around here recommend against dairy. They feel that it isn't a healthy thing. I, I happen to disagree as, you know, one who doesn't eat meat, that having dairy in my diet is a good way to, you know, get protein. protein. But right. um, yes, I mean, you know, and seafood is one where, mm -hmm. you know, people are often allergic to sea. There are all kinds of allergies these days. And, you know, I wonder if it doesn't have to do with the way that they have modified foods in our lifetime so that they aren't what they were and their structures are different and that the human body is reacting to it. So let me ask you what thing is your favorite thing to make? In other words, a meal versus a baking good. Oh, to cook. To cook. Okay. My favorite thing to cook. Well, it's a, uh, um, to me, it's just a good old down home Florida meal, which would be crab cakes and sweet corn and you know fresh sliced tomatoes and you stop know, stop say, you're making me hungry and then peach cobbler. So that oh, would wow. be just a, a, a summer southern meal. Could you do that next week for me? That's <laughs> well, <laughs> pretty doggone good to me. <laughs> I'm always happy to cook. <laughs> you're so cute. Yeah. Um, do you come up with these ideas yourself? And do you have like, is there like a review committee on the paper that you have to say, okay, I want to do a story on this, this, and this, and they have to say yay or nay, or can you just do whatever you want and just pops out on the on the front page or of the food section? <laughs> um, you know, what, one of the thrills of, of being a journalist is coming up with your own ideas and I never lack for them I mean never have not in politics and not in food because life is just so interesting mm -hmm. you know there's just so much so um, no it's the, I generate my ideas and certainly I run them by a you know um, by my editors and say you know do you like this or whatever but I've um, I've never had one killed so. well that's good that yeah. shows you're obviously thinking of good things to do you know we were talking about volunteerism a little bit and you've been um, even though you've only been here here, excuse me, a short period of time, you have gotten very involved in the community, and I think that's wonderful. You and I sit on a number of, of committees together, and I've always enjoyed, you know, watching you work and, and your ideas and everything else because you're so creative. 
why did you want to jump in so quickly? Because, you know, sometimes people want to be here for a while. So there's a lot, as you know, to do in this community, a lot of, of nonprofits. So how did you decide when was the time for you to get in and what organizations you wanted to be associated with? Hmm. Um, the hard truth is that I was unemployed, which allowed me for the very first time in my career in my adult life to volunteer as a journalist and as a political writer in particular I'd never been permitted to do it um, because it would be a conflict and so I'd always wanted to and it was I was like and it also um, gave me an opportunity to meet people and to get into the community quickly which I, I very much wanted and so that was you know that was how it happened and I, I started out by um, at music in the mountains actually oh this is a fun story I went to one of the free concerts at the first national National Bank they have it every mm -hmm. year um, and the um, president at the time Foxy Mason um, uh, I just went up to her and I said you know this is just such a fabulous thing you know I mean I'm just so enamored of the high quality of the music and um, and she said well would you like to get involved? <laughs> and so that was that was how that started. And the next thing I knew, I was meeting with her and um, uh, joining High Notes, which is a fundraising uh, arm. And um, and um, I know um, I met just a lovely, lovely couple, and most people will know them: Carol Solomon and Norman Broad, um, through Richard Ballantyne, the uh, owner of the paper. And uh, she asked me, did I want to join her group called? Top, which is a fundraising arm for the Durango Art Center. I said, sure, you know, that, that sounds good. And um, I'm not remembering how I got involved with the Women's Resource Center, but um, I, I just did. I just said, what can I do? You know, you're such a great organization. Um, Debo, that has to be at Debbie Rota. Uh, and, and I just started working together on, you know, I was like, well, whatever you need, you know, let, let me help out. And these organizations... Um, you know, speak to me as a culture vulture, um, you know, certainly the Arts Center and the music and the Women's Resource Center to, um, you know, the needs of women in modern day and, and an organization that'll help them. And it's it's wonderful to be a part of that. And um, I, I so enjoy it. Well, you know, you've worked a little bit with us as well on the foundation with uh, TLC for FLC and coming to our meetings for that. And I'm going to pull you back in, so don't think you're I'm, walking I'm on the door. I'm there. But, but, you know, I really would love to get you more involved with the, with the college because there are a number of different areas that I think would be of, of interest to you. And I know you come from an educate. You're, you're, both your parents were involved in education. And so it's really in your blood. And so um, I do want to get you more involved up here. I'd and love also, to. You, you are a donor to the college, and we certainly appreciate, you know, your support of that. So we're just going to grab you a couple of other ways. So tell us a little bit about your parents. Oh, well, um, my father was a professor of education, and I grew up in Gainesville, Florida, where he was a, he was a professor there. And um, my mother a, was a uh, counseling psychotherapist. Um, and, um, and my stepfather was also the head of the mental health department at a small uh, women's college in South Carolina. So I have this in my background, and the idea that education is the cornerstone of a functioning and contributing um, citizen is, as you say, just sort of in the blood. And um, I, as we were speaking earlier, I, I realized as I was, you know, deep into my journalism career that um, one of my real passions is writing about education. And part of it is because uh, growing up in Florida, I didn't get a good one. My mm. elementary school education was really quite poor. And the idea of walking into a, a Northeastern college, I went to Boston University, um, and, and just being shocked at how... Uh, ill-prepared I was for what awaited me there. And that's really been formative. I mean, and those are experiences that you don't really get over. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I had good grades and did always did well in school. And, you know, and then you go to a Northeastern University and, it, and you know, whoa. I, whoa. Mm -hmm. And um, so as I've written about education and higher education, too, in particular, it's um, I realize that uh, that comes from my family. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider the possibility of being a t of professor or teacher in high school or elementary school because it was sort of in your blood? You know, this is such an interesting question. Um, uh, no, I'm really dreadful. Uh, I've, I've, I've spoken in front of high school groups and whatever, and, you know, you know, 20 
18 year old faces looking up at you and saying, you know, what have you done for me lately? Um, and I, I, I don't have the patience for that. I can train anybody one to one. I can teach them, you know, uh, to, to write or to, uh, you know, whatever that skill might be. But, um, to, to teach is a, is a skill and a talent that is beyond me. And a little scary probably for most of <laughs> us. Not more than a little. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's, but um, I think the fact that you appreciate education and you understand oh. it so deeply is is really, you know, you're passing that on through a lot of things that you're doing. I hope so. Do you think that you'll ever get involved with the educational side of the paper, writing for for education versus, and maybe continuing with the food side of it as well? But because you have such an interest in education, maybe going to the that part of the paper. You know, I'm just a contract worker, and mm -hmm. I do what they ask me to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, were they to ask me to do that, I'd be perfectly happy. But mm -hmm. I don't think there's a lot of control there. Mm -hmm. So, Well, l let me ask you, because it's almost unfortunately time for the end of our show, if you can believe that. And um, is what have you found in moving from the East Coast to Durango has been your biggest gift to you and Don? And what would you tell for people who are just moving into this community now and maybe listening to the KDUR for the very first time? What would you tell them to make sure that they embrace as new people to this? Because you're still fairly new, you know, in the community. I mean, I've been here 11 years, and I'm still considered new, so. <laughs> then I'll always be considered new. <laughs> um, oh, you know, the community has so much to offer. And... um you know, for whatever your interest is. I'm I'm also a tree hugger and environmentalist, and one of the things uh, uh, about, you know, being a Floridian is loving to be outdoors, and Durango certainly offers that, and that's a, you know, so if that's something that you like, well, that's available to you. If you're, you know, if you're a little bit of an urbanist and, and you enjoy, you know, some small flavor of city life, well, Durango has that too. You know, there are nights when you can go from one event to another event to another. If you're a foodie like me, you know, there are excellent restaurants and and you know, and the farmers market is marvelous, and the food you get here is terrific. And um, but but I guess you know, for me, the thing that has been so delightful is just how welcoming and charming the people have been. And you know, it's sort of, you know, you're in Durango, and um, and you're welcomed, and you're not a stranger. Mm -hmm. And that's you know what a, a nice thing that is as a newcomer. So think of this three a little bit more than three years ago. You were sitting with Don at a table, and he said, "Could you ever think about living here?" And you went, "No." <laughs> And now here you are three years later, you're very ensconced in the community, you've done a lot of volunteer work, you've done a lot of good for this community, the fact that you're now, you. you know, uh, one of our top writers with the, with the newspapers. Oh, you no, flatterer. No, 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 it's, it's, all, it's all true. Um, so isn't it interesting, I mean, would you have thought maybe three and a half years ago that you would be sitting here in KDUR at a, you know, in an interview session, a chat session with, with uh, somebody from the foundation and versus still being in Florida or, you know, someplace else? No, never. I mean, this this was a total surprise. And you sort of, I think one of the things you learn as you get older is you make the best out of what you have. Mm -hmm. And you roll with, with, you know, sort of what God's given you. <laughs> and, so uh, has Don so ever, it's worked out. So has Don ever said, see, I told you this might be a great move. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's smarter than that. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to get <laughs> right. Don't get him in trouble. <laughs> Don't get him in trouble. <laughs> Listen, I want to thank you so much for oh, being here, Pamela. You. It's been just such a treat. And it's been so a gift for me getting to know you through the last few years that we've been on committees together and I hope that we'll have a chance to be oh, on more. Oh, I, I, just, I just trail along in your wake. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Margie sure. the dynamo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I do, as I said, I and, and I'm putting this out publicly so that it'll, I'll, it'll shame her into making sure she does this, but I think um, because of your background in education and your deep commitment to it, I really do want to get you more involved in things up here, things that are, you, could love become to. your passion I, I'd as love well. to. So thanks again. And thank you. For those of you who are listening, thank you so much for being part of today and uh, when you see Pamela on the street be sure and tell her thank you for all those wonderful articles she's writing on food and uh, give her a hug. So thanks very much. We'll look forward to seeing you next Friday on Notes and Motivals. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.